Phoebe, Phoebe Taplin. Uh, Phoebe is a freelance journalist, writer, explorer, and her articles are regularly published in uh, leading papers here and abroad. And she also wrote several seasonal uh, walking um, uh, guides to Moscow. Um, Maria Shevtsova is a professor of drama, theater, and arts in Goldsmiths College, University of London. She has written numerous books and over 130 articles and chapters on various subjects, uh, especially connected to the theater, obviously, so directing, performances, and politics, and the sociology of theater. And April D'Angelis is a playwright whose plays have been staged at the leading well, major theaters, such as the Royal Court, the National, um, or the West End. So, what all these three fantastic women have in common is storytelling, or some, you know, or giving voices to certain occurrences. And what I find particularly interesting is that at the turn of the century, um, there was a sort of a strong upsurge of female writing activity in all kind of different forms uh, of of literature, whether it's prose, poetry, or uh, criticism. And generally, there there was. Um, Kind of, in fact, across, across the globe with sort of the avant-garde and the modernism, this uh, fight against uh, social conventions. And in fact, the 8th of March first started as a socialist political event in America, and then it was taken up in Europe. So, Maria, you uh, particularly um, have a great body of work in uh, relating theater to its social context. So could you tell us more about the social context of the time and what do you think it meant for women? <laughs> a big question. <laughs> I'm not lucky. This is like five, seven, eight, ten books. <laughs> uh, by which end does one start with a subject as vast as this, i.e. context here is really a matter of contexts because each historical period that these wonderful films, this footage is fantastic, <laughs> it's really marvelous. Uh, each, each, each aspect that we saw is really a different context, a different period in the evolution of the Soviet Union and a very different sequences of political struggle which involved the struggle not only for women's independence and women's freedom, and I'll bring in Kolontai in a minute, but these women's, women's questions were deeply embedded in other questions to do with freedom full stop, men's freedom too, the freedom of humanity. So the particular into the general, the gender issue into the whole question of human beings. Secondly, these periods are, are very finely intermeshed, but one needs to make very clear distinctions between 1905, the first revolution, 1917, February and October, the NEP period, which we don't hear about in, these, uh, in, these, in this footage, but which is crucially a turning point, because in the NEP period, Lenin, seeing the economy collapsing, decided that perhaps a solution would be to have limited private property, to reinstate it, at a point in time when after 17, of course 17 was the end of private property and the end of capitalism. It's a very crucial period because in this period is a ma magnificent uh, development of the arts. Criticism, of course, also of the NEP period. Mayakovsky, the great revolutionary playwright, was critical of what was happening in the NEP period. But the NEP period also brought in a critical position for Kollontai, which I'll come back to in a minute. I'm just trying to show you that we can't talk about one context. 24 ends with Lenin's death. Stalin allows it to survive till 29, when the first five-year plan is established, which is the first five-year plan of intensive industrialization. And this is the so-called period when women finally come into their own and become the 56% of the working, of the workforce. But it's a double-edged position because Kollontai in 23 is very quietly shunted off into Oslo for the, as, as, as a, you know, a delegate to the trade commissions. 
we must remember her biography, which is extraordinary. She came out of an aristocratic family, married, had a child. The child was four. She abandoned the family. She became involved in revolutionary activity. She was blacklisted in 1905. She escaped Russia to go to Berlin within a year, where she met Clara Zetkin, whom we saw. Within a year, she her, uh, another warrant of, uh, uh, for her arrest was issued. She had to run to Norway. You know, she's not just a heroine. Uh, it's a double-edged issue, the issue of women heroes or heroines. You know, she suffered enormously. She was constantly in fear. Her life was in danger. She had tremendous prejudice against her for abandoning her family. She, in 1911, in that period before 17, was already speaking about you know, sexuality and what was women's sexuality. She famously said in one of her pamphlets that sex was like drinking a glass of water. Well, it's a very brave thing to have said in the period. I think it would still be pretty brave today for many women to announce this publicly. Her own life has many periods. By, by 1923, she's out of the country. Stalin calls her back. You know, she becomes embroiled in very strongly, always had been very strongly involved with women workers' movements. So she's a pioneer as a woman. In terms of class alliances, she's a very interesting character. And her pioneering of women's rights for working women was major. You know, one could talk, maybe later I could come to this question, of the great women actresses of the period and what they did to help this movement along. You know, Vera Komisarzewska, who died in 1910, but who already was a major manager of a major theater. She hired the great Meyerhold. She also sacked him, by the way. So here is a woman, you know, taking power in the theater. Maria Andreeva, who was the common law wife of Maxim Gorky, who was a revolutionary, who was an actress at the Moscow Art Theater, performed in the theater, had to give dinner parties for her, for her fancy husband, and then, of course, became a rev and was already a revolutionary, and she was doing activist work. And she ended up in Capri with Gorky. She came back finally to the Soviet Union. She became a major Soviet administrator. Oh, these are marvelous kind of women. Ada Talasova, the famous actress, also came out of the Moscow Art Theater, which was, by the way, said to have been a male enclave, you know. But the male enclave was part of some struggle to try and break away from patriarchal structures. And what do you do in a theater when they, it's run by two men? So you see, we have a, a whole complex of factors that make this picture extremely finely intermeshed, multi, multi, multi layered. And in all this, we have an alliance of you know, the women who came out of privileged backgrounds with the women who came out of the peasantry became the, became the workers, the factory workers, whom we saw here. So context, Dolia, is context. Well, of course, it changes. But it's, yeah, a lot, there are a lot, but kind of, especially, I think, the, the turn of the century and lead up to the revolution and the collision between socialist ideals and the woman question, in particular with Kollontai and many other women who came actually from quite well-off backgrounds, and they had a lot to lose. Uh, but they were somehow pushed towards socialism. I think that's even Kollontai's quote, that I think it was a woman's question that pushed me towards socialism. So I think the, 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 the link between the two is quite interesting to, to, to explore. And, and then what happened to it afterwards? Because it was quickly somehow uh, turned into the conservative values went back in the 30s and, and so the whole period of exploration, like with the arts, so with the, uh, the woman's question, went back. <laughs> well, socialism too was a multi-phenomenon. You know, there were many kinds of burgeoning socialisms yeah. in the period when Kolontai took her position very firmly and strongly with working class women. But she famously also insisted in this period, that the women's question was not a class, it actually was still a class <coughs> question. That women of different class origins could not have the same perception of what it was to be a woman and could not have the same perceptions as to how to solve the problem, so-called, of, you know, woman, the woman question. Um, so, and then, of course, the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks is already an indication of different positions on socialism in the theatre, what is 
This is my field, of course, is the one I know best. But in the theatre, it's absolutely incredible to see that already in 1917, 18, 19, 20, 21, 24, you know, there is Mayor Hall with constructivist left, the left, L-E-F, journal set up by, you know, Eisenstein, uh, Mayakovsky, Tretzakov, the playwright, and, and Mayor Hold. And they are considered to be, um, Lenin called them hooligans. This was hooligan socialism. You know, this was the period of anything goes. This was the period of massive, complete liberation, really, in all respects. Not only in the sort of sexual question that Colin Ty was addressing, but in creativity. It's one of the most creative periods of any history, you know, East West, any history. And, 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 and this particular kind of very non bourgeois uh, left was found itself at odds with, you know, the, the spectrum. How did you talk about left in this period? My God, it's a knotty problem. Because this left would have been seen at the period as veering towards the extreme left. And in fact, in today's terms, if we you know, look at this spectrum, the so-called spectrum of politics, then we would have to place this particular group of socialists mm -hmm. on that extreme left, as in fact Stalin placed them himself. Because this left was aligned to Trotsky. Well, we know Trotsky was exiled in 2028. Uh, yes, he was first of all thrown out of the Communist Party in 27. But Trotsky was the one who was always at Mayor Holt's productions, you know, shouting <laughs> slogans, singing the international, because these big events became like political rallies. So there was that left. And so we go down the line. You know, we could easily sort of break it all up to see. And then the big question is, how does the women's question, the questions of women's equality, women's freedom, women's education, the right to abortion, the right to have children and work, because it had to be one, and then the right for women to hold their ground side by side with men, because you know it was one thing to be a public figure, and then they came home and did the washing and the dishes and cooked. Is it any different from the way most women work today? I don't think so, which is why so many of these questions are still so vibrant today. In fact, the more I study this period, the more I think that everything I see in Britain is like a replay on a much nicer scale, kind of very British scale, of the great cataclysms of, you know, the 17 to 29 period. But that's another story. I mean, you see Brexit in this, but that's also another story. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe, maybe the audience is going to ask us afterwards. Um, but, Phoebe, you have written a, a chapter on the female-themed walk in your book on, on Moscow. Um, have you come across these women? Uh, what do you think is their legacy today? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I'm coming from a very much less erudite and knowledgeable background, I'm afraid. But, but yes, I spent five years wandering around Moscow. Uh, and I was writing a column at the time for the Moscow News uh, with a walk every week around a different area of town. And it used to just try and include something seasonal. So it was very interesting seeing March the 8th coming out all the time because obviously as it approached March the 8th, I thought, well, of course, it's, it's got to be a, a Moscow women walk. And I was quite pleased to do it, actually, because in, it was very interesting to see March the 8th as a sort of thread through the film, which I thought was uh, wonderful. Also very interesting seeing all this archive footage of Moscow, uh, places that I know very well. But it's now become, I think, quite a lot associated with sort of giving women flowers and chocolates. And I, I thought it would be quite nice to actually rediscover some of the really great women in Moscow. So, you know, obviously I went to Svetayeva's house and the memorial to Akhmatova and various other people that had done amazing things. And there are just two of them that I wanted to mention, actually, who came up in the film. So towards the end, um, Tereshkova, the first woman in space, uh, one thing I find very fascinating about where she is remembered in Moscow. So in the avenue of cosmonauts is basically very male dominated space obviously and so it's almost physically you can sense this idea of her being a woman in a man's world because you've got obviously Yuri Gagarin and you've got the founders of the whole uh, Karolyov who, who was the sort of father of the space program and even Tsiolkovsky is in pride of place under the big uh, whooshing rocket monument who was the sort of old guy that's you know was in a hut in Kaluga working out the actual formulas that eventually took people into space and so on. And in among them, there you've got Tereshkova. And the other thing I wanted to mention is it's right next door in Moscow geographical terms is uh, Vera Mukhina. I'm probably saying her name wrong, sorry. But anyway, Vera Mukhina, the sculptor who was responsible for this uh, incredible 
a sculpture. I do think it's very interesting, that symbol of a man and a woman going forward together, bringing socialism together. I mean, it, it's also quite a symbolic uh, piece of art, I think, in terms of Moscow history, because when we arrived in Moscow, which was about 2006, it was dismantled and had been for quite a few years, wasn't there at all, and had been just like put away in a shed. And I think a couple of years later, probably about 2008, it was unveiled again to great fanfare and is now absolutely amazing and floodlit and actually higher than it was even in 1937 because it's on a higher pedestal with a huge museum underneath it, which does recognize some of Mukina's work, which is a bit lovely to see. Interestingly, in the center of Moscow, there's a there's very nice monument to her at the end of Prejstensky Periulok where she worked, but her actual studio, I'm quite interested to see, is uh, quite dilapidated still and there's a kind of overgrown apple trees outside and things. It would be interesting to see whether that ever makes it into the kind of uh, panoply of writers and artists' houses, which are quite a big thing in Moscow where people are revered for their, for their achievements. But there's plenty of other uh, people I could mention in Moscow, but those were the two that, that yeah, stood out. Interesting. Well, interesting because some, some women um, so, sort of, not that they disappeared, people are still aware that the tractor driver or the, uh, the idea or the, uh, the idealized image of the tractor driver was part of the culture. But uh, what, what is fascinating, what I found in the archives, you know, I was looking at Pasha and uh, footage and then I would look into the photographs and 8th of March celebrations in particular. This is where you get lots of material. And then I stumbled across uh, Pasha and Balshoi, 8th of March, and then I turned it around and I see Pasha with her two sisters, also tractor drivers. And then, oh, Pasha's granddaughter also tried to drive. So there's kind of a whole dynasty. But unfortunately, you know, later on, um, researching uh, this family, you know, currently it's, uh, it's not great there. It's the Donetsk region, and, you know, they're, they're sort of forgotten. Um, so, so it's interesting how certain images have stayed, but certain uh, are disappearing. And this relationship between the image and reality, and how much... Uh, one really reflects the other, how much the image becomes reality. It's an interesting one, it, it, I think, to, to, to explore. I mean, would, would you like to add anything to that? Or? Don't. <laughs> Later. Later, yeah. okay. Well, April, <laughs> you um, started your career as an actress. I mean, yeah. At the, yes. at, the, at the sort of, uh, may I call it feminist uh, yes. company, yeah. Monstrous Regiment in the 80s, uh, which uh, sought to, well, the main aim was to tell female stories and challenge stereotypes. And I think it's very interesting to think about this idea of the image and the stereotype or typecasting. Um, have you, do you see any similarities between what you saw in this footage and what was going on maybe in the UK or it's very different? Well, it's interesting just to pick up what you were saying about history and the loss of history and how women's history kind of tends to disappear because I think a big push for Monstrous Regiment and other women's companies in the 80s and 90s actually, although they were starting to kind of vanish in the 90s, was um, to kind of retell women's history. So really famously you get a play like Carol Churchill's Vinegar Tom, which in 1976 uh, tells a story of witches but from a, a woman's point of view. Um, and so that's the kind of, ex that's the sort of energy that came into, um, you know, through the second wave women's movement. I mean, it's really interesting as well. One of the things about the film was this idea of women being reconstructed or constructed again, dependent on the necessity of the state, what the state needed for women. Do they need them to be workers or mothers? And then the awful thing where you have to be both. And um, I really like what you're saying about, you know, has anything changed? Do men do more housework now? And um, one feminist has quipped, well, they think they do. That's what's changed, which is quite <laughs> funny. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, and I, I started off in a women's company um, that was funded by the GLC. And very interestingly, when I started out in the 80s, there were a lot of these little seed companies. Um, and they were very radical, and they had a, a political agenda. And the idea was to put women center stage, not to... So if a woman character wasn't somebody's wife, wasn't someone's mistress, wasn't someone's servant, they weren't an agentic, you know, they had agency and they were at the center of the play. They were the kind of, a heroine in a way. I mean, you saw lots of heroines here, so. But what happened was that, of course, Margaret Thatcher came in and kind of just dismantled the GLC and those companies died. Um, 
that's not to say that there, there I mean, a lot, there's been a lot of changes. There are a lot more women. We can think of Vicky Featherstone at the Royal Court or um, the, the woman who runs the Josie Rourke, who runs the Don Mar. And, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, there has been changes. But, um, you know, they, but what's interesting now is, of course, those women are really thinking about, they have to think about um, the mon monetary things. They have to think about, uh, th there has to be a box office success. When we were funded by the GLC, we didn't care about that. We were doing it to like five women and a dog in a community center. <laughs> God knows what we were doing. I'm not saying the plays are good. <laughs> they weren't, no, they were. But, um, you know, they had a lot of, they were political and, and some of them, of course, are like Carol Churchill's plays are, are amazing. And I actually did a play about Alexander Kollontai, which is really funny. I was suddenly remembered. We did a play in 1986 called The Alexander Kollontai Show. Oh. And um, we took it around community centres <laughs> in Peckham and places like that. And, uh, yeah, oh, that's quite interesting. It's, it's interesting to think about the women's writing, but also um, what female parts are out there. Because yeah. there's a, sort of an actor, you, it's interesting how between 30 and 50, there is a sort of a silent period. I mean, of course, there are parts, but you're not a desired object anymore. You're not the typical image of a, of a mother, although, you know, there are many mothers between 30 and 50. Um, could you comment on, on that? I mean, you yeah. have wrote some very interesting female parts, but yeah. generally, what is the sort of the usual type nowadays? <laughs> well, it's kind of, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because there are more women writers, and they are writing, they, they tend to write parts for women that are... Um, you know, more central, more with more agency, less stereotyped. But there's also, you know, it has affected men. There are men writers that are writing that are fem might think of themselves are feminist, and so, you know, will write women's parts with consideration. I'm just thinking of um, people's places, things, for example, the play that was been very successful by um, Duncan Macmillan. That had a, f a, fem a female protagonist, and it was a very powerful role. But it was also, of course, a woman completely out of control because she was an addict. And it, I mean, you have to decide whether you think it's a, you know, that's powerful or it's a, why, why did you choose to write about a woman? Because she was, um, in, a, in a sense, controlled by an addiction. Is that a, that's just a question out Usually there. it's a sort of, there's something wrong with her when she yes. goes out. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hysteric. <laughs> it's the equivalent of the hysteric. I mean, all the 19th century wrote about hysterics like, Head of Garbler, and there was always a problem, and it was always a woman didn't really understand herself, and then she would die at the end, and society would be cured. It was a kind of that. But at the moment, uh, well, I, women are writing parts, but they, uh, you know, they tend to be, I think, for every production, I mean, about 65% are written by male writers and 35 by women, and the women's plays tend to be in smaller theatres for less. Um, the runs are shorter, so there's a kind. There is. There's been a lot of headway, but they're they're less. Um, there's still kind of discrepancy. And um, women's. What what are women's parts like? I mean, I've just been working today with some actresses who, um, young actresses, who, and one of them said to me, "Oh, I just asked to audition for this TV plot drama, and they said to me, would I mind auditioning naked um, for this part?" and uh, only the director will see the... And she said, well, I'm, I'm worried because, you know, will this woman who... You know, I don't know if she gets murdered. Most people do if you're a woman in a thing. But um, she sort of said, no, I don't want to because I'm frightened the tapes will be... Uh, but, they, but she was assured they wouldn't, but she decided not to. And she's sort of a woman in her 20s. And I was sitting there thinking, God, it's so awful. That was my daughter. And she went to work and someone said, do, do you mind aud do, auditioning without your clothes on for this director? You haven't got the part yet. You're not getting paid. I just want to see your tits or whatever. You know, uh, so there's still something um, rotten in the state of Denmark, if you like, about... Uh, yeah, well, interesting. I mean, interesting in the film industry... Um Probably the the, you know, the last 25 major films you've seen, probably 24 were directed by a director, male director. And yeah, well, it's a well-known fact that, that there are not many female uh, directors and also script writers. I mean, you, we were talking about, you know, obviously Harry Potter is written by a woman, but um, it's usually a, the, the, the male writer who adapts it for the screen. I mean, there are many producers in Hollywood, but um, not so much... I think the people that make the stories, 
And um, I should have mentioned the Betchadil test, which is, are there women in, in the piece, in your play, that talk together about something other than men? <laughs> you know, just two women talking together, being together on a stage that's not. And, and also the kind of the idea of the stereotype. Um, for instance, you know, the, there's a kind of also cultural stereotypes uh, in, their, in, in terms of, let's say, Eastern Europeans. There's been, you know, usually whatever, the sexy girl, the you know, prostitute or the refugee, I mean, the expansion of Europe. There's been a Polish receptionist or a Polish nanny. Um, so it's interesting, the kind of these cultural stereotypes uh, as well, um, in, in some ways, could be quite perhaps damaging for the societies at, la at large. I mean, what do you think? Maria, this, this whole idea of the stereotype, um, stereotypes, how much can be changed? Wherever they are, are always created in somebody's interest. <laughs> or else why would you have them? The whole question of stereotypes is another massive thing. Look, if you look at these posters and you look at the stereotyping of women in them, it's very stylized, but it becomes a stereotype with time. Stereotypes are born out of reality. You know, the, 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 the blonde, blue-eyed, tall, skinny, long-legged, beautiful Russian girl. Oops, sorry. The long, if you missed it, the long-legged, <laughs> tall, skinny, beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed Russian girl is a reality. You walk down Kensington and they're popping out at you from all corners. It's actually quite frightening. <laughs> from my neck of the woods, you don't see them. They don't belong where I live. You know, it, 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 but, but so the stereotype grows out of reality. But then reality takes over because it's in somebody's interest to propagate that stereotype. And stereotypes then become, I mean, do I have to tell you, we all know, we open the, the metro in the tube in the morning and your eyes pop out of your head, all these bums, these tits, so why do you want to see them? And they're always the same. Every single time they're the same. And every morning they're the same. That's the big problem. Every morning they're always the same. Somebody's getting not only a kick out of it, somebody's also making money out of it. And you see, we live in, it's a boring thing to say, and I'm sorry to say the obvious, but we do live in this massive celebrity culture where women are traded as, you know, either dreams to celebrity, young girls take up the image of celebrity. Celebrity, it isn't just because it's celebrity, because celebrity is also what it isn't saying. It's symbolic of what? Of access to power, access to money, access to being visible at long last. You've been scraping away in a factory, <laughs> you haven't been visible ever, and nobody ever bothered to look at you, and suddenly you've got a chance to be seen. You know, again, I don't want to fall into the cliches of empowerment, but it's always this very ambiguous paradoxical quality of the stereotype being propagated. The image is a very powerful means of propagating stereotypes. It's one of the most powerful. That's why the theatre is so powerful, because it's also visual. It's powerfully visual, and it's immediate, and it's with an audience. So, you know, I can affect you, too, by the way I'm saying things, and I'm very aware of this. So the stereotype is propagated. But worse still, the stereotype is incarnated. We begin to take it inside of us. It begins to be like a second nature to us. We no longer even notice that it's a stereotype. It's become sort of naturalized, like it's beginning to be the natural form to be this kind of woman. How the hell does one break out of this? Looking at the changing imagery, let's say, in the, throughout the Soviet history of womanhood, and in some ways, you know, we had the libertine type, and then with the 30s, the, the element of masculinity emerged. Uh, and obviously, the war always calls on women as well. And unlike um, maybe here, the, you know, the Russian women were told after the war to, to get out and work. Um, so, uh, but slowly, uh, sort of this cult of femininity re-emerging again. And in some ways, sort of maybe even nowadays, one can argue that the, the ideal image is probably possibly feminine, well-dressed, a little bit shy. It's kind of gone as a very interesting circle. Um, Are so, we so Russia, now? Russia, Russia. Britain. But maybe, maybe, what what do you find the, the contemporary? Because you you also review uh, Russian fiction and you 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 are in touch with contemporary Russian writers. 
What kind of themes are they exploring? Are they, do they look into the past? Yes, yes. There's quite a lot of novels actually now set in the past. There's also even more set in the future. One of the big trends, or at least was, it's less t true now, but the big trends of the last sort of 10 or so years in Russian literature has been dystopian fiction of various kinds where people imagine where we might be going and so on. A lot of them. But I, I just wanted to mention two books I just read uh, recently that I think are quite interesting on this theme. I mean, one is actually just a short story uh, that was translated a few years back and the author, I can never get her name right, is something like Victoria Chikarneva. Anyway, she wrote this short story and it's all narrated by a woman who's trapped in a pipe. And uh, she actually ends up, of course, uh, but, you know, almost unpacking her own metaphor, and she ends up saying towards the end, as a small child, I had already begun crawling into my pipe. The adults were telling me what I could and couldn't do. So I just thought that was interesting with what you said about being trapped. And she's a very young writer, or at least she was when she wrote this, one of the debut prize winners, and she um, uh, you know, was obviously dealing with these themes. Interestingly, actually, another of the debut prize winners, um, Alicia, um, Alisa Ganieva, uh, who's from Dagestan, actually wrote under a male pseudonym. The first prize she won, she won actually under a male pseudonym. And I thought that was quite interesting. And you mentioned Harry Potter. Obviously, J.K. Rowling deliberately wrote with ambiguous initials. And I think, uh, you know, there's still something that's, that's going on there. Actually, Lisa Ganieva now writes under her own name and is mm. very much celebrated, but her original success uh, wasn't. And then I also really need to mention Lyudmila Ulitskaya because she's a, a massive name now ma in uh, Russia. And she was actually the first Russian, contemporary Russian women novelist to win the Russian Booker Prize uh, in 2001, which was about 10 years after it was actually established. So it took quite a long time for any women to win it at all. And interestingly, I think in the last 15 years or so since she won it, I think it's been won by three, three or four other women. So not... not nowhere near equality yet and interestingly not because publishers tell me that pretty much half the books they're publishing are written by women and so, uh, certainly more than half the sales I mean they account for the women writers account for more than half the sales let alone obviously readers as we know tend to be a lot of women but uh, so it's not an imbalance in the actual books that are being produced but there is still an imbalance in terms of the wards and I think that's quite interesting because I think it tends to speak to what is considered culturally important uh, and I think that the, uh, the big book prize actually is even worse. I think there's only been two women. Interestingly, though, one of them, the most recent, um, Zuleika Opens Her Eyes, is a very interesting new novelist um, uh, with a Tatar background. Very uh, interesting book. It's not been translated yet, so I only know <coughs> what the author's told me about it, but it sounds like it's going to be uh, a good uh, contribution to the literary scene. Uh, when we finally get an English translation, everyone should read it. There's lots of very interesting women writers out there. Um, it's the same old problem that whether they're recognised uh, fully it will take time. Also, what I'm interested in exploring is this emphasis on, 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 on this idea that a woman can do a man's job. Um, it, it's quite unique, and, and I wonder what that has done for womanhood or the woman's question in general. I mean, it wasn't obviously great that, the, that, that things were being imposed on people, and almost there was a script that said, well, this is going to be now the hero, and this is who is going to be the star. But the emphasis on, on this idea that the woman can do it m might have been quite interesting. I don't know. Would anyone like to? <laughs> can I turn that question to you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, your film does show this, and clearly yeah. you are interested in it. What are your observations? Well, I think I, I think it, it did. It did have an effect. I think there are maybe there are not women in political power as much or in business as much, but there are. There are. There are many women, successful women bankers uh, in you know in the professional life. I know plenty of women that juggle, still juggle both <laughs> kids and work. Um, and I, husbands I'm not or and husbands <laughs> or one husband. <laughs> And, and but I'm I'm not great on statistics. I don't know what would be the comparison between you know the Russia and, and here. But um, I, I do find that there are kind of different influences that have informed, let's say, me than than um, maybe somebody else at the school door. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So I sometimes wonder. I don't know whether anyone here wonders. I sometimes wonder whether whether this whole thing about feminism one great big con. <laughs> yes, a great big have for women. You know, we're screwed. 
basically. <laughs> we have to be everything to everybody. We have got, we've got to be able to do everything, like these superwomen here. I mean, your subject really is about superwomen, isn't it? When I worked in the United States, do you remember, I can't tell you how mortified, how mortified I was. Sorry, I forget that there's a stupid thing here. Um, how mortified I was when I had to do a lot of interviewing of women. Every morning I took them for breakfast at 8 o'clock. Oh, these were really gruelling days. 8 o'clock breakfast, then I had to take them to meet so-and-so, then I had to take them to meet the dean, then they had to go and meet some administrator, then they had to go and meet the president, and then they had to, give the, then they had to go and meet the department, and then they had to give a lecture. It was like lasted three days. Three days! Every poor woman for the job of what? Ha-ha! Professor of Women's Studies. <laughs> but I was mortified when one of these really famous, famous American feminists said to me over breakfast at about five minutes past eight, and I'd had to get off my child to the creche, and I had to get myself ready, and I had to get my makeup on and look like I meant business, you know, and all this sort of stuff. Now, there's your stereotype. You have to go and look like you mean business. Yeah, I couldn't flop along in my nightgown and slippers. <laughs> And she said to me, and this is when I fell apart, she said, you know what, I never thought I had ever met a superwoman till I met you. My jaw dropped. This was the 80s, and I was smart enough to know, I mean, I'm so dumb on all sorts of things, but on this case, I was smart enough to know that to be told you were a superwoman was a bad word. It was actually an inverted insult. And I knew that, and she knew I knew. It was fine, no, no hard feelings. But do you see Superwoman? Yeah, it's right, it's, got, it, it's a this con. It. The Superwoman's a con. a con. Superwoman is definitely a but, con. But feminism isn't a con. Well, I because, wonder. Well, Agreed. because one of the feminist the demands of the women's movement in the 80s was um, childcare on demand, um, you know, which meant that, you know, mother, that you, in a 24-hour childcare on demand, so it was, and it was free. And for mothers uh, who want to work, I mean, that's a, what, why, isn't that, why isn't that never happened? Why are people still, when I have my daughter, it's a terrible struggle. Childcare is just a, he, you know, it's a real, he, it's madness, you know. Yeah, but then that's not because, you know, we can be superwoman, you can be rewarded because you can cope with all these things. But actually, that's why this film talked about, you know, the connection between socialism and feminism. You know, you can't have really, how can you have one without the other, really? Because if you can pay for care, that's fine, and you'll be able to be superwoman. But if you're a working woman with children, yeah. how can you? How, how is that gonna? How is it gonna work? You know. And so I, you know, I'm a total. I'm I'm with them. <laughs> I'm with Alexander Kollontai, and I was in her show. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. One could hardly not be with them. But when I say, is it a con? I think Alexandra Kollontai had it absolutely right. You could not be, you know, an emancipated woman, an equal woman, getting equal pay for equal work, for equal conditions, unless you had childcare. Yeah. So she was the one behind the whole idea that you had childcare in the factories. You had it in the working place. Mm. Now that, that is the answer, mm. but how many, how many do we see childcares in the banks or in the lawyers, you know, factories? <laughs> Let's call them factories. Um, how many childcare uh, setups do you see? I know there have been attempts. I'm not trying to be a smart ass and say it never happened. It has happened. There have been so-called enlightened, you know, heads of managers, directors who have attempted to do this. Who you know, who do things like give women time to go off flexi hours. These are these are the really serious questions: the flexi hours, the childcare, the dads getting, uh, you know. What do they call it? Yeah. Paternity leave. But yes. again, also yes. what's interesting. This kind of thing. This might be the but, answer. But, but also, you know, what, who wants equality with zero hour contracts equal to what? You know, that's the other question about equality. Women yeah, want to be is. equal to, yeah, to other men who have terrible working conditions, which that makes a, that's why socialism, and that's what these women were wanting, weren't they? They don't, they don't make sense without each other, I don't think. No, well, that's what Colin Ty said, and as far as I'm concerned, she's the heroine. <laughs> another, another feature of Moscow uh, sort of geography that's relevant there is these old buildings like the Narkomfin building, which were actually set up to be communal living places. So you had childcare facilities, cooking, laundry, all in common. 
and it, it was very much in order to liberate women from the sort of servitude of a domestic situation. So everything was in common. It was kind of radical, a radical vision. And then women could have friendships. They could be time locked away in their families, were they? I can imagine it was good fun. Mm. Interesting. No idea how it actually worked, but these buildings... We hated now. each other. <laughs> um, I think, um, just because of time, I could, yeah. I could continue, but I'd like to um, ask the audience if, if you have any questions, if you would like... It's nice to hear the audience on the films. <laughs> yes? I think Russia in the late 70s or the 80s probably had the worst record for oppression of women in Europe. Um, you know, the worst sexual harassment, the worst cases of uh, women expected to work all day at, at, at work and then do all the housework at home. Um, it was kind of almost no matter how you measure it. And I'm wondering why that was. Was it the result of 70 years of socialism? Um, was it my favorite theory that it's a shortage of men after the Second World War leading women to accept things? Or was there something else going on? And also the economy is slowly going down. So that's also, I think, quite, quite an important factor because it, even if you had a wonderful school, maybe that school slowly is deteriorating as well as the nursery. So all the social provisions uh, maybe are not that great anymore. Plus the queues are coming up and the shortages. So life becomes harder. And, but the, the fall of the welfare system also um, brought further problems. And I think by the time of the 90s, there were some terrible um, statistics that over one million children in orphanages have both parents, but who cannot afford to keep them. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Would, would anyone like to add? No, I, don't, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Really, I'm stymied. <laughs> I don't know. I, am, I wonder where, you know, where, where else in the world uh, women were also heavily oppressed. Maybe it mightn't have been the who 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 created the I mean who who wrote that it was the worst who did the research I'm not aware of it so I can't answer you. Well, it, it's my observation. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't I don't know. You know I don't know what the maybe because there's an awareness of feminism. That's why you start looking at women. Maybe they, that's how you start thinking of them as having a hard time. Is you have to have the kind of feminist mindset to even begin. Mm. So maybe that's what was. But late 70s are an interesting period because, you know, the first feminist journal come, came out in, in, in St. Petersburg, which was only published, I think, 10 copies or something, and, you know, it was suppressed and the women had to emigrate because, essentially, you know, Soviet women are the happiest in the world. What's the problem? <laughs> and sometimes it helps to be said, you're the happiest in the world, and then, oh, okay, I'm happy. <laughs> Maybe, you know. So... Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, but it, I think it's a slowly the, the kind of the, the fall of the empire has started. Um, yes? No, no. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, you could discuss a little bit more the attitude uh, in Russia, the attitude of Russian women to the issue of feminism. Because as far as I know, uh, being originally Russian woman, um, uh, women in Russia still treat feminism with uh, suspicion. Yeah, and we true. definitely like being treated as ladies, and we don't mind men uh, having good manners and opening doors in front of us and helping us with coat. And if they, we don't treat it as something humiliating. Um, so I'm wondering if you could extend a little bit on the issue of feminism in Russia and how, um, how it's treated and if people accept it. This is only conjecture. Since you're looking at me, you know, I always respond to an eye. And I don't know. <laughs> it's my theatre training. Um, I think feminism already, in the 70s, feminism was certainly a bad word. And in the 80s, I remember meeting Russian feminists, two or three, very few, who were in the United States and who felt they could not stay in, it was still the Soviet Union, it was before Perestroika. They didn't feel they could stay because there was no room for them to be feminists. So you've put your finger on a very important question. My own sort of, it's a conjecture. It's only wishy-washy thinking. I have no real concrete reason to say this. But in my wishy-washy thinking, I suspect that this has very deep roots historically. I suspect it does go to the pre-war period to the 30s, specifically to this period that we were looking at here, 
where why would you be a feminist if you were equal and we were fighting for socialism and we were fighting for justice for everybody? So, you know, what was the point of setting up something that seemed to be on the outside of it? Because feminism in, in Western Europe and in the United States, as in Britain, of course, has always been um, a contestatory movement. So, you know, if, if you're all working towards the same ends in socialism, why would you contest? That's a baby answer. It's not even an answer. It's a kind of a thinking aloud, wishy-washy. <laughs> but it might be somewhere where we might start doing research mm. to get, to get uh, the answer. I think it's a very interesting, very relevant mm. point. I definitely found that a lot in Russia. The people were, you know, why would I want to be a feminist? And exactly as you say, I, I don't mind having doors open. I don't mind having doors open for me. I'm definitely a feminist. You know, I, I think it's a kind of misconception of what feminism is, to think that having a door held open for you, you know, that, that we all find that humiliating. I mean, you know, and I, I think Russia is somewhere that could, that could use more of a feminist movement, quite honestly, from what I've seen of uh, the way a lot of women there feel about their lives and yet don't feel ready to embrace it. It's been sort of vilified as this kind of, you know, ridiculous thing that, you know, people have somewhere else, you know, and we have real men and real women. I mean, I think it's... Uh, I don't think it's helpful, uh, but it's a very interesting topic of difference. I agree totally. It's a very elementary notion of feminism, reduced down to the most... Deliberately, I think, because people don't want it to get a... <laughs> yeah, I would call opening a door courtesy. A man opens me a door, I walk through, I hold it for him. But I think it's a very interesting... We've got a couple of questions here. Of the in Russia. Can you, I mean, the gay, the gender, the gay. Oh, I'm sorry. Certainly. Come up. That's all. It's not because we're yeah. folk. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, I mean, myself, you know, I think it's until the theory kind of became mm. someone who we definitely kind of not, well, I wouldn't say worship, but you know, she definitely became a big, bigger when I was maybe 20, 25, or something like that, right? Sorry, who, who, who became? Yeah. As a fear, yeah. Well. yeah. You know, for someone like myself, who mm -hmm. is kind of about 49, 50, or whatever, we're, I think we're kind of similar generation. She was yeah. really the first kind of public figure, mm -hmm. who very openly was gay, and with whom we as 25-year-olds or whatever could associate with. Not associate necessarily in terms of kind of, you know, being homosexual or not, but she definitely <clears throat> is someone who is not to be ignored. I mean, I admire her, respect her, and I think there are many other people who do. But until then, there was literally no one. Shush, shush, you know? And I... And it's something well, that's it's going just, backwards, yeah. as far as I can see. I mean, it's, it's also one of those things that's, you know... Personally, I find it yeah. important because, you know, you talk about rights and not rights, but there is this one area where, you know, there is a certain group of women of course. who are openly oppressed in Russia. Um, I think we just can't not talk about that. No, no, of course. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, it's just uh, just it's a whole other area, and, and uh, you know. Maybe we didn't talk. And about I think it. because we also stop at perestroika, yeah. and up to the point of perestroika, essentially, officially in Russia, there was no sex. I'm joking, but that was <laughs> what 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 kind of you know the whole idea of sex was not really discussed, and there was a one model of a strong, healthy family, and that's it. So actually, lots of people were not even aware and that there was another possibility. Um, so yeah. it just challenges patriarchy, doesn't it? Gay, gay rights have always, you know, it's not, it's not about the paternalistic um, father, the heterosexual matrix, anything that challenge and does challenge patriarchy and that, that idea of the family. So it, that it would be, they're sort of linked, feminism and gay rights, aren't they, really powerfully? Yes, and I think exactly that, that part of the rejection of feminism, insofar as it goes on, is to do with the idea that it's emasculating, and that's a very troubling concept, more, more than it used to be. I mean, it seems to be a, a, something that's actually getting worse, unfortunately, as far as I can see. Which goes with war in a weird way. I don't know, because the film and war, and after the war, the kind of conservatism that comes in, and the kind of re that war somehow feeds on mas an ident masculine identity in a really negative way and then impacts on women and... 
but also mobilizes women and shifts, I think, relationships. Yes. Last question. We haven't got much time. But we have to have a drink. That's it. <laughs> A sort of high. Aggression of, of, of women in this context speaks to that fundamental kind of political puzzle of, of state socialism, of how, how that is orchestrated, that calibration between personal and the political. And I think that one of the prime, I mean, I work in Cuba myself, and a lot of these things are very familiar to me from a Cuban perspective. One of the prime mechanisms through which this calibration was, was tried was orchestrated in the Soviet Union and in Cuba and China as well was precisely through this idea of the exemplar. You talked a lot about stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I would use the word exemplar for stereotypes as a kind of derogatory connotation. I think this sculpture that we're looking at is, of course, a, a beautiful one. So yeah. it is, a, is an art form of the exemplar in some sense, mm -hmm. right? in which a political ideal is kind of manifest and mm -hmm. incarnated in a particular kind of superwoman or superman. Right? Yeah. The idea of the vanguard is another way, you know, mm -hmm. people being awarded for being you know, the tractor woman and so on. <laughs> Uh, so, now, what strikes me about your film is that, in a way, it adopts that. Mm. So, you've, in a, in, in a sense, adopted yourself in the, in the manner in which you tell this story, mm -hmm. a socialist modality <laughs> of calibrating the political and personal, because essentially the, the story is being told through this series of exemplars, right? These super, mm. and not perhaps in the sense of the, of the lady, the Spirit of Maria, those things. But, and I was just wondering, uh, <coughs> in that context, if, by doing that, you're missing, of course, the, the underbelly of that story, which is the manner in which, if you like, if these are the extraordinary women, mm. the manners in which the ordinary women did or didn't orient their well, lives with uh, respect to these examples. The, the, Somehow yeah. that No, no, the, the reality, or the, the, what was kind of behind the sort of the, this uh, imagery, let's say, or, or iconography. Well, it's definitely one of the things to explore. And it's also one of the things that is not really present much in archives. <laughs> in archives, you find the great achievements and the wonderful things and the stars. So, um, y you know, I think maybe there's a slight cheekiness in my voice, <laughs> hopefully, which sometimes you, you have caught. Uh, but uh, generally, yes, it is something to explore, definitely. And, and, and I, but I think also with those women, you know, there's stars or not stars, they, you know, they, they also, it, 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 it's, um, it, it, they all, there was a kind of a struggle for survival, and that was a way to survive, to, let's say, be a tractor driver or, or you know, to achieve uh, uh, amazing things, because, yeah, I don't think life was easy <laughs> for many, even though there were practical uh, provisions, but, you know, there was a, also general fear in society, um, and, uh, yeah, it's interesting that, um, Somebody recently saw this exhibition and said to me, your films are about survival. And I thought, really, are they? And actually, that, that's, that's, I found quite, quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just quickly say one word in response to that? I mean, the thing is, what's surely the most obvious and the most dramatic and the most wonderful aspect of this sculpture and such sculpture, which we call social surrealism, is that for the first time in history, the invisible downtrodden masses were made into great monuments. Mm -hmm. Previously, the big leaders of armies and emperors and kings and gods, they were made large in this. The most, that's what is so dramatic about and beautiful about, about that. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that it's the lower made into the higher. Starting, no starting history from zero. Although you see that, I think there are also imageries of Madonna here. You know, even the socialism adapts the old in, in, its, in its interesting way. So we really have to stop. But okay, yeah, quickly. It's uh, not a question. I just want to share a fact about some double standards uh, mm. on that uh, point uh, during the Second World War. I recently read uh, an article about female warriors yeah, who uh, went to war and 
In fact, uh, there was not even a female uniform up until, I think, 1944. Mm. And they had to wear a male uniform. Interesting. There was no sanitary supply really? at all. And uh, in fact, they were raped. And that was, uh, you know, all, pretty much all raped. And when they came back, it was somewhat consent in a way. Yeah? Mm. When they came back, they were all shamed and called prostitutes. There was a lot of double standards. Yeah, yeah there's um, night witches or whatever you call it, they were glorified. But there was like two or three million women who mm. were raped, having no sanctuary supply mm. for five years. Yeah, well, and it's a whole other area that sort of. The, the sp split, I think, that yes. was happening in the society between, let's say, great family, but yet you have you can betray your father or mother for the cause of the party. Absolutely, that's, that's another side. There's a new yeah. book, in fact, exactly about those women out last year called Defending the Motherland. Mm -hmm. Very interesting book that shows a much more complicated story, I think, than there's time for there. And very much Marina Raskova, who comes across as this great hero in the book, definitely is quite a kind of complicated and dark figure in lots of ways, betraying some of her colleagues to uh, death camps and so on. I mean, it's actually a, a much more fraught story, I think, than this kind it's of... There's such uh, a huge material. Is, is, it? There's, a, there's a lot of uh, d double standards going on. But I'd on like there. to thank my panellists and you, and uh, let's, let's have a drink. <laughs> thank you.